All right. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, hello, and welcome to Crossroads Church. If you're out in the lobby, we're going to get started in here so you can make your way on in. My name is Tim Griesbach. I'm one of our pastors, and I am just so thrilled that we get to set aside some time to be together today here at Crossroads. So here at Crossroads, we are a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church focused on making disciples of the next generation, our kids and our grandkids. So everything that we do in the gathering, which is today, and everything that we do throughout the whole rest of the week is focused on that, is desperately trying to help our children and our grandchildren and our neighbors to find and fall in love with Jesus. If you are new to Crossroads and you would like to say, hey, I'm here, don't do that right now. Gosh, that'd be terrible. But you can let us know that you're here by texting the word new to our text hotline, 720-513-1933. And one of our individuals on our connections team will get a hold of you, will connect with you, and just say hi back and begin that process of the introduction. Well, as we are celebrating life change that God is doing through the gift of his son Jesus in our lives, that looks a lot of the times like baptism. And so today, again, we've got the horse trough out here, which means life change. So take a look at this as we celebrate another one. I'm 15 and I enjoy playing basketball in my free time. Um, since I have accepted Jesus into my life, I think that he has allowed me to be a more open person and just overall a better person in general. And it makes me feel good knowing that I'm helping other people to be better as well. My big thing is that I want to be a lawyer to help out people. Helping people is something that's like really important to me, um, especially too like when people get like they're put into jail for things that they didn't do. That's something that just doesn't sit right with me and I feel bad for them, so I want to help them out. I think like overall, like if I had grown up without God being in life, my whole mentality would be set to something different than how it is now. It always reminds me that even like when I make mistakes and things like that, God's always going to be there for me and He's still going to love me and He's always going to forgive me. My name is Bella and I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, Bella, it has been just amazing getting to know you and your story, and I just love your heart of compassion and justice that God has given you. And I'm so excited for all the cool things that he has in store for you in your future. And it is because of your testimony and your obvious trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior that I baptize you today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That never gets old, man, does it? What an Whew. awesome story. What an amazing man, way an amazing to start way our, to start time, our time, time as we celebrate life change, the, the work that God is doing in the hearts of people. Man, it just is amazing. And so uh, what a way to start our time. I want to welcome you today. My name is Chris, one of the pastors here. If we have not met, uh, welcome to those of you who are here at Thornton Campus. Also welcome to those of you who are watching online, uh, listening to the podcast, uh, on Facebook, wherever you're at online. Uh, welcome also to those of you who are at our Fort Lupton campus. Man, it is a good day to be together. We are in the middle of our three-week series called The Weird Things Christians Do, because let's be honest, Christians are weird, all right? Uh, just, that's okay, embrace that. Uh, Christians are weird. In fact, if you are maybe somewhat new to Crossroads Church, uh, in the last few months or even within the last year, you probably remember a time when you sort of just scratched your head and thought, huh, that's weird. Why do they do that? Why do Christians do that? And here's the thing. Christians are supposed to be weird. We're supposed to be weird. In fact, we are supposed to be distinct and set apart and different from the culture around us. If we just simply kind of blended into the world around us, into the culture, and, and we, we didn't stick out like a sore thumb, we, wouldn't, we would cease to be 
the church. So we want to embrace the weird. In fact, we thought throughout the series, we thought, what are some of the weirdest things that we do that we could spend some time talking about uh, and explaining? And, and those three things are our baptism that we saw just now, we talked about last week. Today we're talking about communion, and then next week we're talking about uh, when we all stand together in a big room with lyrics on the screen and we sing songs together. Three of the, some of the weirdest things, if you're on the outside looking in, some of the weirdest things that we can do. And here's the thing, is if you're new to Crossroads Church, um, the, what I want you to know is that some of the weirdest things that we do are also some of the most important things that we do. Some of the weirdest things that we do are some of the most important things that we do. If you're not new to Crossroads Church, and, and maybe you don't think any of these things are, re are weird, uh, that you've seen them for a long time, perhaps you've gone to the other extreme. Maybe you come to church every week and you see baptism after baptism, and you're no longer moved. And you take communion, and, and it's just another thing. And we stand and sing songs, and you just sort of stand there with your arms crossed and think, well, when is this going to be over? All right? Here's my hope for this series is not only will we explain some of the weird things that we do, but really, man, we hope that, just, that this would reignite in us a passion about some of the weird things that we get to do as believers. That it would reignite in us a passion for these things, that we would grow deeper in our faith and grow closer to Jesus. And so today, we're going to be looking at one of the weird things that we do, which is communion. Now, when it comes to communion, uh, churches all agree, Christian churches all agree on one thing. And sort of like baptism, they agree on one thing, and then after that, it's just like it goes off in a million places. But here's what Christian churches, for the most part, agree on, is that when it comes to communion, Jesus started it. It was his idea that he sat down with his disciples on Passover as they were celebrating and remembering God's deliverance from their forefathers that were, that were enslaved in Egypt which was Passover, the Feast of Passover. And there Jesus took the cup and he took the bread and he passed it around. He said, whenever you do this, remember my body and my blood broken for you. That's what Christian churches, for the most part, agree on. After that, it's a different story. If you have a Catholic background, you understand communion as being Holy Communion or the Eucharist. And the Catholic theology on, uh, on communion is that when the priest prays for and blesses the bread and the wine, that it remains physically bread and wine, but the essence of what it is turns into the actual blood and body of Jesus. It's called transubstantiation. It's a fancy word for saying that the bread and, blood become, or bread and cup become the actual body and blood of Jesus. Other denominations have more of a mystical understanding that the mystical presence of Jesus is within the bread and the, and the wine. Other denominations still treat it as symbolic, that the bread and the cup are, are simply tools that Jesus gives us because we're human and we forget things. He gives us this tool of communion to, to remember one of the most important things that ever happened in the course of history. That's, that's where Crossroads stands. That the reason why we take communion every weekend and we pass out these little cups is because we want to remember, we want to reorient our hearts and reorient our minds around the truth of the gospel, that we need that remembrance all the time, that the, that the elements themselves are simply symbolic. Whatever your background was as a kid, I remember being a kid and just being super stoked on the first weekend of the month because it meant snack time and church service. It was awesome, right? You see some churches, they use bread, others use crackers. Some churches use juice and others use wine. Some churches use wine unintentionally when the, juice has been, when the juice has been sitting in the church cupboard for too long and it's fermented a little bit. You see, there's lots of different ways, lots of different understanding. If you're at home, maybe you've been taking communion with orange juice and pretzels, right? Here's the thing. Whatever your experience or background is, we're going to look back on the, the biblical understanding of what communion is. Now, there's a lot to cover about what it, when it comes to communion, but we're actually going to go back before Jesus gave it to his disciples. And we're going to be looking at a story in John chapter 6. Now, John chapter 6, if you want to turn there, there's a lot going on in this chapter. 
In John chapter 6 is the story, if you remember, of this huge crowd of people that is following Jesus around the countryside by the Sea of Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem a little ways. And there's this huge crowd, thousands. The Bible says that there's about 5,000 men. And so there could have been maybe 10,000 people, who knows, that were following Jesus around. And one day, uh, the disciples were there, and it was about lunchtime. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, hey, what do you think we should do? Because all these people are hungry, and it's lunchtime. And they're kind of like, oh, I don't really know what to do. Like, it's going to cost a whole ton of money to feed all these people. I'm not really sure what to do. But then Andrew, one of Jesus' disciples, who is also Peter's brother, comes up to Jesus and says, "Uh, hey, Jesus, there's a kid here who's got a couple of fish and five loaves of bread. What do you want to do with that? Now, either Andrew had totally skipped out on math class as a kid, or he had incredible faith in what Jesus could do with this kid's lunch. And sure enough, Jesus took the bread and the fish, and he multiplied it, so much so that he could feed the entire crowd of people, and that there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers afterwards, right? So these people just experienced this amazing, uh, this amazing miracle where Jesus fed them. And uh, later on that day, that Jesus and his disciples are tired. Uh, after feeding all these people. And so his disciples are like, hey, we're going to go down to the sea, get in our boat, and head across the sea to the city of Capernaum. And Jesus is like, go ahead, I'll catch up. I'm going to go off by myself, which he often did, and pray and spend some time refreshing there. Later on that night, Jesus catches up to them, not in a boat, but he walks on water, and he freaks them out, right? And so they're all like, wow, what's going on? All that to say, the night goes on, they, they, they go to sleep, they wake up the next day, And the crowd that Jesus had just fed, guess what? They were hungry again. They were hungry again. And and, and they thought, like you and I would, like, hey, I'm hungry, you're hungry, I got an idea. Remember what yesterday when Jesus like did this amazing thing? Let's go find him again. Be sure to bring your lunch because he can multiply it, and then we'll all get lunch today, right? And so here we are picking up this story in verse 25 where it says this, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set the seal. Now, here's what's going on here. With the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people, Jesus is setting up this humongous teaching illustration. And he's using bread as the object lesson. And what he tells these people who come and find him and want more lunch, he says, look, don't work for the food that perishes. Don't seek for the food that perishes, but instead seek for the food that endures. Now, this is an important phrase, all right? And I want you to remember it. So we're going to do it together. Don't seek for the food that perishes. Work for the food that endures. Let's try it one more time really loud. Don't work for the food that perishes. All right, work for the food that endures. So here Jesus is telling them, look, I got something else. And you can just imagine the crowd sort of leaning in. And they start talking amongst themselves. Like, what do you mean? Do you mean like you're going to start dropping food from heaven like what happened with Moses and the Israelites in the desert? Because that would be cool. If we could just go outside and watch manna falling from the sky and go out and collect it, is that what you mean by the food that endures? And Jesus says this in verse 33. He says, no, but for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, well, sir, give us this bread always. Of course we want the bread that endures. But Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So what happens is the Jews hear this, and they start to grumble amongst themselves. They're like, did you just hear what this guy said? 
Like, we know who he is. We know that Jesus is the son of Mary and Joseph, that he's from Nazareth. Who in the world does he think he is saying that he's the bread of life that's come from heaven? We know who he is. And they started kind of grumbling amongst themselves. And Jesus answers them in verse 47. He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so they continued. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And just when you think things couldn't get any weirder, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my f- blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks My blood abides in me, and I in him, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, if you can just imagine being in this crowd and hearing this for the first time, or even if you're hearing this story for the first time, if you're honest, you think, Man, that, it, that's scandalous. Like, what in the world is he talking about? And even when you look at the words in the Greek, he didn't mince words. He literally used words like, you need to chew on my fleshy tissue, and you need to drink and ingest the red stuff running through my veins. This is literally what he's telling this crowd. I mean, it's scandalous. It's gross. You can see how early church and throughout church history, people accused Christians of being cannibals or maybe even vampires because of this. And so as a result, the crowd that was once huge looking for, f- for food starts to thin out. People are looking around at each other going, not me, I'm not, that's gross, man, I'm not doing that. I, I'm just getting ill thinking about it. I'm out. And they turn around and they leave. So much so that Jesus then turns to his disciples and says, are you guys going to go too? And they're like, well, (laughs) at this point, after what you just said, I mean, really, where are we going to go? Like, we can't go anywhere, so I guess you're stuck with us, Jesus. Now, remember the phrases I asked you to remember? That we don't work for the food that perishes, but we work for the food that endures. You see, what Jesus is doing here is he's setting up this huge illustration with a contrast between the two types of bread. And he uses physical bread as the example of bread that perishes. Physical bread. You need, you need bread every day. You need food every day. I mean, maybe in our low-carb culture, like, you know, I, can't, I can't do bread, I can't do, I can't do gluten, da, 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 right? But whatever that is, you need food every day, right? Because then tomorrow it vanishes, and you need to eat again, unless you're like my 12-year-old boy who, like, 30 minutes later... He needs to eat again, right? But physical food, it doesn't last. Now, I love love to eat. And if you stop and if you think about how how cool it is and how creative it is that, that God, when he designed everything, when he created everything out of nothing, that he also sort of went an extra mile and said, you know what, I'm going to allow them to taste things. And here's what that's going to be like. And there's going to be foods that have different tastes. And there's going to be some that are pleasant. And there's going to be some that are going to be terrible. But but I'm going to allow them to taste things. Like, have you ever thought about that? I mean, take it for granted. But man, it's pretty amazing that God gave us this gift. But but here's the thing. Is that even at the the, the biggest dinner you could ever remember, the the Thanksgiving dinner that that you are so hungry for, you know, like I, I, I starve myself all morning, right? Starve. And then, and then it comes Thanksgiving mealtime and you're like, oh, right. And you fill your plate and, and so satisfying to, to have that sense of hunger and then have that sense of satisfaction. But the next day, what are you doing? You're, you're 
heating up the leftovers again. You're heating up the leftovers. Why? Because it just doesn't last. And so here's Jesus' deeper point, is that just as you hunger physically, every human being on the face of the earth since the beginning of time also hungers spiritually. That being human means that we have this spiritual hunger, we have this hole inside of us, this void that we can't fill with anything else, but we try. We try, and, and man, the perishable, bre- the perishable bread is so easy to try to fill this hole in our souls. And here's the big idea of what Jesus is talking about here is this. You can fill the hole of your soul with things that perish or things that endure. You can fill that hole in your soul with things that will perish or things that will endure. That this is what we've been trying to do since the fall of mankind. Filling that hole in our soul with whatever it is. And it can be good things. We try to fill that hole, don't we, with friends, relationships, cars, and money, and success, and careers, and shopping, and and food, and hobbies, and sex, and whatever it might be. And these are good things. And they allow for human flourishing, but they're terrible gods. They're good things, but they don't fill that hole in your soul, do they? You know, one of the most common ways that I see people trying to fill the hole in their soul is actually with good works. Like with their own righteousness. And you might be thinking, wait a second, Chris, aren't we supposed to do good things? Aren't we supposed to live righteously? Aren't we supposed to to go out and do good things and be obedient and all of those things? And I would say, yeah, just don't make them your God. It's like if you remember the story of the prodigal son, right? Two sons, one goes and tries to fill the hole in his soul with clearly things that will perish, right? Loose living, the Bible says, prostitutes, spending his money on whatever it is that he wants, just sort of going out and living wild and crazy, The other son was at home, and he remained obedient, and he was equally as lost, if not more. Why? Because he was depending on his own self-righteousness to fill this gap in his soul. You see, it can be good things that we try to fill our soul with. And if you're like me, you've been down this road countless times, haven't you? You've been down the road of trying to fill your soul with things that will perish. You've been down that road, and what was that road like for you? Do you remember? Maybe it was just recently, and you realized, oh man, I'm on the wrong road. Maybe you're, maybe you're there right now, where you are right here, and right now you are exhausted and you're tired because, man, the things that you're chasing, you, that you think are going to fill your soul, are just leaving you empty and frustrated and exhausted. You see, here's the thing, is that we try to find our identities, our purpose, our meaning, our salvation, our our inclusion, our destiny, whatever it is, we're we're trying to find who we are. We're, We're trying to fill those cracks in our character. Trying to fill that hole in our soul with things that that just don't perish, or that just don't last. They they perish. And here's the the tricky thing is that bread that perishes is really intriguing, isn't it? Like it looks so good. It it looks so satisfying. And here's the tricky thing is that just like your Thanksgiving dinner, the bread that perishes will satisfy you. And then it won't. It vanishes. It looks so intriguing. And really what happens is that we can get so caught up in chasing bread that perishes that we forget about bread that endures. C.S. Lewis, in his sermon, The Weight of Glory, says it this way. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he simply cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. You see, the bread that perishes is really 
attractive and intriguing, and then it vanishes. But the bread that endures, the bread that endures, the bread of life, this is something way better. It will give you all that you've ever wanted. It's the answer to the question that's deep inside your soul, the the question that all of humanity has asked. Everybody in the face of the earth has asked the question, and the, the bread of life is the answer. How do I fill this hole in my soul? How do I experience life, true life? What happens after I die? How do I get to experience life after I die? You see, this bread gives you an identity that can't be taken from you. This bread makes you whole. This bread makes you live forever. And we hear this, and this crowd hears this and goes, man, I want some, I want it. And Jesus says, I'm right here. I'm right here. And you and I are faced with a choice. Are we going to turn around and walk away like the rest of the crowd did? Or are we going to partake in the bread of life? Let me ask you this. What, right now, what kind of bread are you chasing? kind of bread are you chasing? You can fill the hole in your soul with things that will perish or things that will endure. And Jesus says, look, it's up to you. Nobody's going to make you make a choice. Nobody's going to make you do it. Nobody's, I'm not going to force myself on you. It is totally up to you. You have a choice. What are you going to do? Are you caught in that never-ending treadmill of chasing the bread that's going to just leave you hungry again? Or are you chasing the bread of life? Now, I love in this story how Jesus uses this extreme, explicit, scandalous language about how you have to chew on my flesh and drink my blood. And then he doesn't give his disciples any relief. He doesn't pull them aside afterwards, after the crowd leaves. He doesn't pull them aside and say, hey, guys, let me tell you what I really meant. Just so you know, like, I'm not going to make you eat my body. and da, 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 Like, don't freak out. It's okay. He doesn't do any of that. He just lets them live in this tension. And I can just imagine the disciples walking around for the next couple of years going, hey, Peter, do you remember that day when Jesus told us we had to eat him and then pour his blood into a cup and drink it? Like, I'm about to lose my lunch just thinking about it. What, do you, what, do you, what are we going to do? What are we going to do when that happens? I don't know if I can do that. It, it just creeps me out. It is so freaky, right? But then in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. They're celebrating Passover like they had done every year for a long, long time. And he takes the bread... It says this in verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And after blessing it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of of sins. And I can just imagine this sigh of relief across the room with the disciples like, oh man, this is what he meant. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that he meant bread and juice and wine and, and not like his actual flesh and blood. Like I'm so relieved. And what happens is the, the, the dots started to connect for the disciples and they, and they think back to Passover because this is what we're celebrating. And Passover, the Jews were, were saved because they had slaughtered lambs and they painted the blood of the lamb around their doorpost. And they're like, okay, yeah, we remember that. And then remember John the Baptist and what he talked about, how, how here comes the lamb of God, Jesus, who comes to take away the sins of the world. Yeah, I remember that. And they're like, oh my goodness, It all makes sense. Jesus is the the, the lamb. Jesus is the sacrifice. This is the new covenant. No longer do we have to make sacrifices of animals anymore for sin. No longer do we have to come and, and pay off what's going on, that Jesus is the one who's paid the ultimate price. This is what he meant by that he was the bread of life and the blood of the new covenant. No longer do I need to chase this bread that's going to leave me empty. That I get to have the bread that endures forever because the Lamb of God was willing to sacrifice himself in your place and in my place. 
Man, what an amazing thing that he paid the price, the price of something that I could not pay. And because his flesh was torn and his blood was spilled out, that we can stand before a powerful and holy and almighty God without blemish, without stain, without sin. And we can stand in front of him fully justified and forgiven. You see, this is an invitation for you to reject the bread that perishes and to embrace the bread that endures. What are you going to do? And for some of you, you're here and you're, you're listening, you're online and you're, you're, you're watching and, and you're wondering, man, I don't know that I've ever done this. I don't know that I've ever responded to this invitation. I don't know that I've ever tasted the bread of life. And I would say, this is the time. There's no need to wait. That the invitation is open for you now. Would you take it? Would you, would you partake in who Jesus is? And let me just say, like, what kind of king does that? What kind of king willingly steps off of his throne and puts on flesh and comes down and, and lives a poor and humble life and is beaten and bruised and torn apart for you? What kind of king does that? A king that loves you more than you could ever dare to imagine. That's who. A king that loves you more than than any of us deserve. That's who. Would you respond to his invitation today? I'm going to say a prayer. And if you want to respond to his invitation today, just say this prayer in the quietness of your hearts. Well, Father, we do come to you today and we are just humbled by this amazing truth that your son, Jesus Christ, fully God, became fully man, put on flesh, and lived among us, all for the purpose that he would be the living sacrifice, the Lamb of God, sacrificed in our place. God, we're tired of running. We're tired of chasing things that don't last. We're tired of, of eating the food, God, that perishes. And God, we so desperately want the bread that endures. So, Father, we do. We, we say yes. God, we say yes. Would you draw us closer? Would you draw us in? And in doing so, Father, would you just remind us that we are forgiven, that we are fully loved. God, that we are made right before you. Not because of our own self-righteousness, not because of our own obedience or anything else like that, God, because it's all about you and what you've done. And so, Father, we thank you for that. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came, who came to take away the sins of the world, we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, maybe for the first time, then we would love to walk with you in that. We'd love to talk with you, answer questions, pray with you. Just simply text the name Jesus to the number on your screen, and a live person will get back in touch with you. You see, this is one of the weirdest things that we do, but it's also one of the most important things that we do every weekend. Why? Because this is a symbol of the most meaningful moment in all of history. That God would put on flesh and become a living sacrifice for you and for me. That his body would be broken and his blood poured out. That we might have life. And it was on that night of Passover that Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body. Whenever you eat of it, remember my body broken for you. Let's remember together. In the cup, he gave thanks. He passed it around and he said, whenever you drink of this cup, remember my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Let's remember together. We're going to stand and sing and worship together. We're going to respond to this amazing king who is self-sacrificing. 
If you would like prayer today, one of the joys of being able, of being here and being online and being a part of the body of Christ is that we get to come together and pray for each other. So whether that's a, a, something that's going really well in your life that you'd like to just celebrate with someone, whether that's a need in your life or in your family's life or whatever's going on, we have people over here to your right who would love uh, to step out in the hall with you and pray with you. We also have people online, just click the button and there will be someone there to pray with you, all right? All right, let's sing together. As we continue to worship God through song this morning, we just wanna take some time to welcome those joining us from the DRDC, as well as the women joining from the Denver Women's Correctional Facility today. Let's join our hearts together in adoration of our King today. We worship you, Lord. Let's turn our hearts to recognize his faithfulness and his goodness. throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing
start singing the sweeter sounds than freedom sounds it may get loud but let's start singing yeah, celebrate celebrate the King seated on the throne
so much to celebrate, don't we? And when it comes to what our king has done, like Chris said, what kind of a king expresses love like that to give of himself to rescue us who were once enemies and now get to be children? And I love that our king doesn't just rescue us into gathering together for one hour, one day of the week, right? Man, that would be kind of like, oh, I can't wait till the next one. But like he rescues us into life with him as a part of his family with each other. And so here at Crossroads, we take that seriously and take it seriously, the process of helping people to get connected with others within the family. And so Kristen's here today to help us understand a bit of how that can happen. Yeah, thanks, Tim. We've made connecting here really easy. You can do it right where you're at by simply texting that number on the screen. You can text the word NEW. If you're new here, want to let us know you're here, we can uh, text with you or chat on the phone. Uh, you can text the word NEXT if you're curious about what the next steps are here. Uh, this could be to learn about community groups, which by the way, they are open for signups for the next two weeks. Uh, you could also learn about growth tracks or maybe baptism. And then finally, you can text the word Jesus, like Pastor Chris said, to learn more about Jesus and why he's so important to us and why we ultimately want to connect you to him. Yeah, so community groups are open for the next two weeks. And if they miss that, they're hosed for life. That's right. 
Okay, so there's no sign other things. Up. No, that's just kidding. But seriously, take this opportunity to get to know other people within our community. And also, if you're a part of our community, there's an opportunity to join with the mission of Crossroads, serving people toward and connecting people to Jesus. And the way that you can do that is there's a whole bunch of them, but one of them is financially. So if you're like, man, I love what's happening here and I love how people are finding Jesus here. I want to help that out by giving some money. It's really easy to do that. You can do that online through our app, or if you want, you can send one of those cool pieces of paper with your signature and some numbers on it to our North Glen location, and they'll be able to help that get into the bank account somehow magically. It's all magic ones and zeros anyways. But that'll be another way that you can participate in what's happening here at Crossroads. So this fall is going to be pretty awesome. There's some big things happening, and we want to make sure that you don't miss out on one of them specifically. So it's we got a really short teaser video to give you a clue as to what's going to start in two weeks, a new series we've got called Man to Man. So check this out. If you know a man, you don't want to miss this. Yeah, two weeks. And before you leave, I would love to speak a blessing over you. So if you could raise your hands, I'll be reading from Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I hope you all have a blessed day. Thank you so much for coming. We love you. See you next week.